So understanding heart disease is at the core of American health. But here's the twist. Cholesterol has long been cast as this villain in the story of heart disease, right? Test your cholesterol, lower your cholesterol, take your medication for cholesterol, cholesterol will kill you. But it turns out that that's not the whole story at all. In fact, over 50% of people who have heart attacks have normal cholesterol. That doesn't really make sense, does it? How is it possible? How is it possible that it should be the case that every single person with a heart attack should have like cholesterol through the roof, right? But what else could be causing this heart issue? Well, you should know by now what I'm going to say is what's driving all disease. And the real villain is inflammation. So today, we need to understand the connection between inflammation and heart disease and why cholesterol is totally not the whole story. So before we jump in to explain all that, let's talk a little bit about how to let us know that you're here. Of course, if you're on YouTube, don't forget to like and subscribe because it makes us so happy. If you're listening on the podcast, my hair looks good. I'm wearing like a new method jacket. If you want more of these videos, we actually launched a video course. You could find it at thenewmethod.com slash course, and you can get a whole bunch of stuff, PDFs, all this fun stuff. Okay, let's jump in. Enough of that. So the first thing we have to do is kind of debunk this idea that cholesterol is the villain. But to do that, we first have to understand what cholesterol is, right? Like, let's get a basic understanding of what this horrible, terrible thing is. Okay, so let's talk about that. Cholesterol is a substance that your body makes naturally. You're supposed to have it. You need it. It's a waxy, fat-like substance that's found in all the cells of your body. Now, it's not inherently bad. It's also not inherently good. It's just something that you need, and you need a cholesterol in so many ways. You need it to make bile, right? And bile helps us digest fat. So if you didn't have cholesterol, you wouldn't be able to eat anything fatty. You need cholesterol to keep the cell walls. Every single cell wall membrane needs cholesterol. You need cholesterol to build hormones. You need cholesterol for vitamin D. You need for estrogen, progesterone, testosterone. No cholesterol, no hormones. The list goes on and on and on. So if cholesterol is good, then why do we have to go every year to get our cholesterol checked? Like, what are you saying? And the answer to that is because we need the right kind of cholesterol, the right amount of cholesterol, but more importantly, we need it in the right place. So let's take a look at what that means. What is this cholesterol test that we get at the doctor's office, right? Or the NP or the PA. So we have HDL, cholesterol, LDL, VLDL, like what is all this? What does it mean? And so to get, understand that, I want to give you a visual. And the visual looks like this. In our bodies, Cholesterol is a fat, and fat cannot travel in the bloodstream because the bloodstream is water, so it doesn't work well. So it needs a vehicle to transport. And this vehicle is what we call lipoproteins, and I want you to imagine them as boats. So you have these boats that carry the cholesterol in your blood. So you have LDL. Consider those like delivery boats. The, the LDL, they are small boats. They carry cholesterol from the liver, where it's made, to the rest of the body. And LDL is crucial because every cell needs cholesterol for all these functions I told you about, right? But if there's too many LDLs or if there are types that are prone to get damaged, we'll talk about that, then they can deposit cholesterol in the walls of the arteries. The arteries are, the, are your pipes, pipes that carry blood. We don't want cholesterol on the walls of those arteries. If those arteries get plaques, and we'll talk more about that again, that's not good for our heart. And that's why we say LDL is the bad cholesterol. We don't want a lot of this one. And for most people, we want an optimal level of LDL below 100. So then we have the HDL, which is the good cholesterol. And I want you to think of that one like garbage collection boats, because the HDL acts like garbage collection. They travel around the bloodstream. They collect excess cholesterol, including some cholesterol that's deposited in the arteries, and they bring it back to the liver, right? So LDL takes it out of the liver. This brings it back to the liver. And this is why HDL is often labeled as good cholesterol because it helps remove some of that excess cholesterol that could lead plaque formation. Having a higher HDL is usually better, right? For most people, we want it above 60. We do need to discuss triglycerides, because if you've ever looked at your labs, you know that it's there. And triglycerides is another type of fat in the bloodstream. And, you know, it's kind of part, we have to consider it when we're talking about this whole what, traffic in the bloodstream. If your body has too many calories, especially from sugar or carbs, it converts it into triglycerides and triglycerides are connected to heart problems. You want that to be below 150. Then there's VLDL. I want you to think of VLDL as the cargo ship because they carry triglycerides and cholesterol. It's a large cargo ship in the bloodstream. And its job is to transport these triglycerides, that other type of fat, from the liver to various tissues in the body. And it also carries cholesterol. But its main cargo is triglycerides. 
And VLDL, which is like the really bad cholesterol, it delivers triglycerides to cells and it also like sheds some of its load. It becomes smaller and denser and denser, eventually turning into LDL. In a sense, it's kind of connected to LDL. It is also really important for our cardiovascular health. Cardiovascular means our heart and our vessels. If we have too high VLDL, that's a problem. Too high LDL is a problem. Too high triglycerides is a problem. They are all risk factors, heart issues. And then we have the other number on our labs called the total cholesterol. And that's basically the combination of all these boats. So if someone says, oh, my cholesterol is 210, great. But how much of that 210 is HDL? How much of that is LDL? So total cholesterol doesn't help so much without that breakdown. Why are we even counting all this? Like, why do we need to know how many boats of cargo boats and delivery boats? Like, why do we even need to know? So the short answer is that LDL can cause some damage to the vessels, right? That LDL boat is carrying cholesterol. Think about what would happen if there's like an oil spill, okay? Or if that boat create damage. So let me tell you what happens with this LDL. LDL causes plaque formation in the arteries. So does cholesterol, if it's too much, it can start building up on the walls of the arteries. Fancy word for that is atherosclerosis. Basically, now you have like these plaques. What should be a nice smooth pipe, your arteries now has like these deposits. So now these deposits are making the arteries, if they're supposed to be these big arteries, now they're narrower because they have like all these plaques inside and they're harder. So over time, this cholesterol accumulates, the plaque grows, the arteries get narrow, and it makes it harder for blood to flow. And the arterial walls become less flexible because they're full of this plaque. Fancy word for that is arteriosclerosis. So now we have these narrowing, hardening arteries. Who cares? Well, two things can happen. One, it's narrow, it's hard, it creates pressure, hypertension. The narrowing of arteries creates that increased blood pressure. And because we have these plaques on the wall, they can come off, become unstable, and now it can form a clot, and that clot can travel. If it travels to your heart, it's a heart attack. If it travels to your brain, it's a stroke, right? So pretty intense stuff. So you might be saying, okay, you, <laughs> you're contradicting yourself. It sounds like cholesterol is really dangerous. Like, where's the myth? You said it's not, but now you just told me like LDL causes all this trouble. So yes and no. The myth is that our initial understanding of cholesterol is exactly what I just told you. You have too much, it sticks to the wall, eventually it comes off, it becomes a clot, becomes a heart attack. But in the past few years, we've come to understand that that is just part of the picture. Because the real, what's really happening is that this entire process, it's not just a passive buildup. It's not just if I have cholesterol, it will happen. It's actually an active inflammatory process. And understanding this as an inflammatory process changes everything. Okay, so let's talk about this inflammation connection. Like, what's the difference? Who cares if it's just plaque or plaque inflammation? So it's really an important distinction, and you'll see why. Okay, so this is how it works. First of all, it's not just if you have LDL, the plaque is going to form. It's understanding that there's an injury to the artery wall. So think of that pipe, a little crack, because it's a little injury. So what causes that injury to begin with? Inflammation. So you have inflammation first, inflammation first, which creates a little nick in the pipe. And now cholesterol is more likely to build up. So you need inflammation first to get that LDL trapped. But inflammation doesn't end there. It doesn't just create the injury. It also is what makes the plaque dangerous. So you had the nick. Now think of it like kind of like spackle, <laughs> like a little bit of that plaque. But by itself, that's not dangerous either. What happens is that inflammation now takes that plaque and oxidizes it. Okay, so think of it as rusting, like an apple slice turning brown. Now you have this browned, rusted LDL, and that's bad news for you. So let's repeat that. Inflammation causes the injury. LDL gets trapped, gathers inside, then that same inflammation changes that plaque, that LDL, into something called oxidized plaque. This plaque is a nuisance and our body does not like it. And that, and because it doesn't like it, it sends white blood cells to take care of this intruder, causing more swelling and more inflammation in the process. So now you have more and more cholesterol, more browned LDL, this oxidized LDL, and now you have the swell because the white blood cells are making this whole thing bigger and bigger and bigger. And as the plaque grows, the inflammation gets worse, making the plaque bulge into the pathway, which bulges into the pipe, making it narrower and harder and harder and reducing blood flow. So you start to see that this is not just a passive collection of cholesterol. The inflammation is driving it. And the most dangerous part now is that you have like this volcano waiting to erupt. And that's when the plaque ruptures. And that's when it can travel to your heart or your brain 
you know, heart attack or stroke. And if the clot grows too big, it can stop the blood flow entirely. And that's a problem as well because it stops oxygen from getting to where it needs to go. So you could see how inflammation is the driver. It's the flame behind all the things. So now think about it. Someone with high cholesterol, but no inflammation versus someone with normal cholesterol, but high inflammation. Who do you think has a higher chance of a heart attack? It's the second one. So on paper, Mr. Smith has higher cholesterol, but Mr. Jones is walking around with fire. He's more likely to have a higher heart attack. He's the case that says, I don't know how that happened. His cholesterol has been normal for five years. This is how. Okay, so that's why we know that cholesterol panel is actually not comprehensive. If you go to your provider and all you get is your total cholesterol, your HDL, your LDL, and your VLDL, that's not a comprehensive panel because we need to know inflammation levels. So a true comprehensive panel now includes something called CRP, that's inflammation, homocysteine, inflammation, ferritin levels, inflammation. So this is not just the boats of your cholesterol. When we are looking at a new comprehensive cholesterol panel on our blood work, we need to see the inflammatory markers as well. Because to truly get your head around your heart disease, you have to understand your body's inflammation level. The cholesterol numbers are not enough. Inflamed arterial walls attract that bad cholesterol, creating that plaque, right? So we need to know what's going on here. So when we talk about heart disease, we need to understand that it's connected to inflammation. In fact, the research has shown that elevated levels of CRP, elevated levels of inflammation are associated with a higher risk of a cardiovascular event. I will break this down into English in a minute. Independent of cholesterol levels. That means you can have completely normal cholesterol. But if your inflammation is high, you're at a higher risk for a heart attack or a stroke. Hear me out. Normal cholesterol. But if your inflammation is high, you're at a higher risk for a heart attack or a stroke. That is a huge deal. So when we're talking about cardiovascular disease in America, we have to talk about inflammation, right? And that's not just coronary artery disease, heart attacks, heart failure, arrhythmias, stroke, hypertension, peripheral artery disease. Inflammation plays a role in each and every one of these. Okay, so we cannot talk about cardiovascular or heart disease without talking about inflammation, okay? I think you get it now. So, okay, like E, I get it. Inflammation is dangerous, but what do I do? Like, what do I do? So now let's talk about how to manage the disease. And of course, we can't talk about treating, you know, heart disease without mentioning the conventional medicine approach, which often involves prescribing statin drugs. Now, again, I am not telling you, nor will I ever tell you not to take medication or, you know, ignore medical advice. I will never tell you that. And I'm not giving you medical advice here. I'm just trying to provide a broader perspective on what's going on. So statins work. Yeah, they work. They help reduce LDL cholesterol. They can slightly raise the HDL, the good kind. They lower triglycerides. And that's great. But you know what else statins do? You know, you know the main reasons why statins work? It's not so much because they lower your cholesterol. They do do that. But it's because they reduce inflammation. They're actually anti-inflammatory. What they discovered is that when you start taking statins, they lower your risk within 24 hours. But your cholesterol did not go down in 24 hours from that statin. What went down is your inflammation. So the reason statins help so much, especially in the beginning, is because it brings down your inflammation. And the issue is, of course, the statins also have side effects, right? Again, I'm not telling you not to take them, but they can cause muscle pain, rhabdomyolysis, liver enzymes to rise, GI issues, increased blood sugars, memory issues. They're an intense medication. So if there's a possibility to prevent needing it or if we're already on it, if we want to find a way to safely come off of them, the focus has to be on inflammation. Managing your heart health involves managing all the sources of inflammation in your body, right? And that means your diet. And I'm not saying just a low cholesterol diet. I'm saying an anti-inflammatory diet. Your microbiome, because that causes inflammation. Your sleep, because lack of sleep is inflammatory. And your movement. There's no shortcuts here, but it's just a different mindset. It's not like I just have to get my numbers down. So we have to change your nutrition, not just to lose weight, but also to help you switch up the cholesterol type, help your body produce more HDL, less LDL, give it the building blocks it needs, right? So cut back on the saturated and trans fat and the simple sugars, give it more plant-based foods, right? Eat the rainbow, add the good fats in. It's not about eating an apple a day. It's about eating an avocado a day. They consider intermittent fasting. Why? Because it's super anti-inflammatory. Prioritize sleep. Why? It's not just about feeling awesome when you wake up. It reduces inflammation. Movement. One of the most effective ways to keep your heart healthy is to move regularly. Okay? Regular movement helps increase HDL and reduce inflammation. Of course, I have to put on a list, quit smoking and cut down alcohol, but like, duh. And keep your stress levels in check because stress increases inflammation. It also disrupts your sleep. It also impacts what you eat. 
right? So stress is a big deal. And we talk about stress. It's not just, oh my God, I'm working so hard, but also if there's loneliness and isolation, that's a big deal too. Like get out there, go have coffee with your friend. It's okay. Coffee is okay. And then of course, everyone wants to know about supplements. So we can't have this conversation without talking about red yeast rice. Red yeast rice, traditional Chinese supplement, and it's made by fermenting rice and with this particular yeast. And it's packed with these compounds called monocolins. And monocolin K is one of the most well-studied and, and well-known. In fact, the very first statin called lovastatin was designed to mimic this red yeast rice because it naturally lowers your LDL cholesterol. So think of red yeast rice as like a gentle, natural statin that can support healthy cholesterol levels. But remember, it's not a direct one-for-one -one substitute. And so please, no self-medicating or like unguided switching, okay? Do everything with a provider on board. CoQ10, coenzyme Q10, the ultimate in inflammation control. Again, CoQ10 is found naturally in your body and it's part of like working with your mitochondria, helps you create energy and you need it for your heart and it's important to create energy for your heart. But CoQ10 also does more than just provide energy. It protects yourself from damage. Remember that rust thing we talked about, the oxidization? CoQ10 helps defend for that. And it helps us balance our HDL and LDL levels. We cannot have a heart healthy conversation without talking about omega-3. Omega-3s, it just calms down the bias inflammation process. Turmeric, anti-inflammatory, curcumin, anti-inflammatory. Green tea extract, okay? In green tea, there was something called EGCG. It's a compound that is super antioxidant and anti-inflammatory. Resveratrol, found in red wine, grapes, and berries. It's also a supplement. It helps protect that lining that's called that endothelium, that lining the inside of your vessels. And quercetin, it's a supplement, but it's also found in fruits and vegetables. Super anti-inflammatory, super antioxidant. Okay, so go get that list. So a quick recap. At the core of heart disease is inflammation. So concentrating solely on the numbers makes no sense. You must also consider inflammation. Otherwise, you're not fixing the problem. To lessen your chance of heart disease and cardiovascular disease in general, you need to find and eliminate the source of inflammation. Sometimes it's as simple as fixing your belly or maybe fixing your sleep. And sometimes it's about removing toxic exposures and chronic issues. Either way, you have to identify and tackle the root cause. And that's the only way to get to everything. So don't just focus on the numbers. As always, if you want to work with me and my team, you can reach out to us on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, you name it, we're at The New Method. Or you can join our video course at thenewmethod.com slash course. However you choose to engage with us, I just want you to remember that you're a game changer. And don't forget that I called it The New Method. Why? Because you always knew there was a better way. I'll see you guys next week.